What's cracking, big homies? Welcome back to the HQ. As always, it's your man's Nicholas. Big dog's got to eat fantasy football. We're going to turn that volume off so no one wants to hear that-ish. Especially this early in the morning. Uh, I wasn't going to do a mock draft this week because we did a different video on Friday, but I was like, you know what? It's crunch time. My peoples need the analysis. So we're doing a 12-team. Um, I believe this is half PPR because Yahoo uh, recently switched their normal league settings to half PPR as well as a flex spot instead of a third wide receiver. So we're picking from the fourth spot here, y'all. It's a 12-team league, half PPR, picking from the fourth position. If you're watching this, then I'm probably in the middle of uh, a live redraft league with my New York City peeps, the uh, subscribers only live draft right now. So wish my ass lurk. Um, and with the fourth spot, we have, stop texting me, Brandon. We have Gurley going off the board, Zeke going off the board, and I'm sure it's either going to be Bell or Le'Veon. I mean, Bell or <laughs> DJ. Yes, yeah, so Bell went off the board. And Yesterday's video is either yesterday or Thursday's video. I'm not sure when I ended up releasing it. Uh, I talked about the dra uh, the best draft position, so I'm not going to get too deep into it. Um, but I, I just got randomly placed into the fourth spot. But if I had to pick a spot that I want to draft from, it is easily the number one through four spot because you get one of the top four running backs. Fourth would actually be my preferred spot because I'm happy with whichever of the top four guys of the top four running backs fall to me. Because when you have a workhorse running back, that is one of the most advantageous things you can have in fantasy football. When you have a guy who's getting all the carries, they are more valuable than any uh, top-tier wide receiver outside of a historic year, of course. Um, but the top-tier guys are the ones that give you an advantage in fantasy football, and those are the guys that help you win your league. Picking fourth overall also makes sure that you kind of ward yourself off from the positional runs that will happen. So if you're in the top four and you get the fourth pick, um, you know, you don't have to reach for players necessarily because you're kind of in the middle of the draft. Whereas if you get the one, yeah, you get one of those running backs, but then each time you pick, there are 20 or 25 picks in between your next spot. And there's a good chance that, you know, the tiers drop off quickly, whether it's quarterback or tight end. Um, and you kind of get put in a bad spot. So being at the fourth pick also gets you the earliest pick in round two of the guys that get their top four running backs. So I'll be completely happy with David Johnson as my four. Um, considering he's looked great this preseason and I'm probably moving him up my rankings to maybe the three spot ahead of Gurley. Uh, no matter, you know, this def this offense is going to be bad. Well, may maybe not necessarily bad, but they're set up to be kind of bad on paper because their offensive line is bad and they don't have a lot of weapons there. So David, David Johnson is going to absolutely eat. And it's not enough something we haven't heard before. Like we obviously know this, but it was really good seeing him in preseason and just back to his normal self. And he just looks like an animal who's going to catch 75, 80 passes, um, and, and just be an absolute monster. So I'm happy with any of those four guys. DJ just does have the worst uh, position in terms of like offensively, like the team around him, which is why I have him ranked fourth right now. But again, I'm probably going to move him up. So after DJ, we saw Antonio Brown, Saquon Barkley, Kamara, DeAndre Hopkins, Kareem Hunt, Melvin Gordon, OBJ, Leonard Fournette at 12 to wrap up round one, and Julio Jones at 13. Now, in my second pick, I'm probably, uh, I mean, I'm going to have to see who falls to me here, but it doesn't, it looks like all the top running backs are off the board. All the guys that I would consider here. Um, and it's actually funny because like when you look at these rankings, it's pretty crazy because like Christian McCaffrey's all the way down at 32. However, he's being taken now after all the good preseason games he's had and the usage we've seen him have with the first team. He's, he's, ca he's handling like 80% of the carries there um, and 80 or like 85% of both the touches and the snaps there for the first team. So CJ Anderson is clearly not being as involved in this uh, offense with the first team or on the goal line as we originally anticipated. So look for C-Mac to have a pretty monster year. Um, I'm going to end up sorting this by ADP because I think that's more realistic here. Yeah, people start moving down. So I would be ecstatic to have C-Mac at 21. I doubt he falls to me there. Um, but if it's not C-Mac, I would be eyeing Demonte Adams, who I doubt will fall to me there. And let's see. It's kind of tough because a lot of the guys that you really liked at this spot at pick 21, um, the Jarek McKinnons, the Doug Baldwins, um, any of those type of guys, you know, they ended up getting hurt. Or even LaShawn McCoy, T.Y. Hilton, right? They're kind of banged up. So they are ones that you could have gotten for values at the end of the second round or early third round. But now with their injury situations, it kind of scares you off. So we'll just have to see who falls to me here. <laughs> Gronk falls to me at 21. I wouldn't be too mad about it. I haven't experimented too much with drafting 
tight ends early, but I see C-Mac and Gronk are still there. So it would probably be one of those two guys for me. Again, guys, do not take quarterbacks up here. The fact that he's ADP of 22 is out of control. Mm, come on. So we have who went earlier. After Julio, we had Devonta Freeman, Dalvin Cook, Michael Thomas, Keenan Allen, Devonta Adams, A.J. Green, Christian McCaffrey. Okay, so there goes McCaffrey. Uh, when I'm looking at the board, I I really am of the belief that Gronk is in his own tier all by himself this year. Um, and people are going to put Kelsey. Obviously, Kelsey's right behind him there. People want to put Ertz as like the big three. I think Gronk is the big one. The same way when you look at wide receivers, it's Antonio Brown and then kind of everyone else there. I know people will disagree and probably put D-Hop or Julio Jones in that kind of category or even Odell. But for me, it's Rob Gronkowski. And then uh, everyone else is kind of a huge tier behind him. Um, if Gronk is, obviously, this is a big if, Gronk, if he's healthy, uh, then you're getting someone who's almost guaranteed 1,100 yards and double-digit touchdowns, especially with, you know, they lose Brandon Cooks, they lose Danny uh, Amendola, Julian Edelman suspended for the first four games. So Chris Hogan and Gronk are going to absolutely eat throughout that first month. And I wouldn't be surprised if Gronk walks away from September with like five touchdowns in his stat category. So it, uh, Mike Evans, Joe Mixon, Thielen, and Kelsey go off the board here. And I'm definitely taking a different approach than I have been. For the most part, because with if you're going to take Gronk this early, which I'm fine with, right? Because I think he's a value at 21. You're going to want to obviously make sure that you back him up with another tight end later in the draft. But there's a lot of uh, kind of like hidden gems, I think, at the end of draft picks. Um, and normally, I like to leave the first couple rounds with two running backs. However, I don't see value at the running back position right now. If you guys want to go ahead and take uh, LaShawn McCoy, be my guest. But I'm absolutely steering clear of him this early in the draft. Because, I mean, everything we've seen, what is this ADP? How is the Marco Murray at 55? This is out of control. Um, let me redo these because I'm not seeing players that I'm looking for. I'm going to go with Stefan Diggs here. Uh, and I, I kind of said this in my wide receiver rankings video, wide receiver ranking by tier. Uh, Stefan Diggs has pretty much been the third round pick in all of my drafts thus far. And I haven't ranked above, if I'm following my rankings, I haven't ranked above pretty much everyone that's left on the board right now. And I just don't see a lot of running back value there. So guys, I do say that I want to leave the first couple rounds, first three rounds with with usually two running backs, even three, if it, if it falls to me at that. But you got to be fluid throughout these drafts. Um, and Stefan Diggs is a guy who I think is just going to link up with Kirk very, uh, very fluidly. And he's a guy who, you know, Kirk has struggled in the red zone. Stefan Diggs' attributes play that very well. He's great at separating in really tight spaces. He's great at contested catches. So um, Stefan Diggs, I think, will overtake Thielen for the wide receiver one there, at least in terms of volume. So I'm excited to see Stefan Diggs kind of break out. So we have David Johnson as RB1, Diggs as wide receiver one, and Gronk as my tight end one. Uh, we've got like 10 or 12 more picks before my next pick. And when we get to the middle rounds, man, it's kind of not a wasteland for running backs, but I do like the wide receiver value here a lot more. Um, but a lot of the young running backs are still available in these in these later rounds, like an Alex Collins, a Royce Freeman. Even though Royce Freeman's kind of shooting up the ADPs lately, uh, I I would like him probably. I said, like, I don't want to take Royce Freeman in the fourth round. I think that's a little bit of a risk. But if you're at the end of the fourth round, early fifth, like I am, I'm okay with that. I do think that they're going to be really uh, in a running back by committee there, at least over like the first few weeks, first month, maybe even first half of the season. I don't think Devontae Booker is really going anywhere. So if you, you, you know, you might not think he's a, a good talent and that's perfectly fine. I don't think he's anything special, but they clearly want to use him. They've been splitting snaps completely evenly throughout their preseason game. Uh, Booker's actually got both of the starts, but Freeman has looked better in both games. So I'm interested to see what happens in their week three game. Um, by the time you're watching this, you've actually probably seen some preseason action already. I'm filming this on Wednesday, so any of my analysis right now doesn't go into preseason week three games for Thursday night, Friday night. Um, so I'm not sure when Denver plays, actually. Let me look that up. I'm going to look it up for you. So we'll have more of an idea on Royce Freeman probably after their week three game. We'll have a better idea for a lot of these players. So just remember that. Take that for granted. Uh, the guys I'm drafting now, again, this is on Wednesday. I'm filming because I leave for New York City for the uh, subscriber live draft weekend on uh, on Friday. So I won't really be around to watch most of the games or film videos, I should say. Where are you, Broncos? All right, so Broncos play on Friday. So we'll have a better idea whether or not he'd be a good pick here. Um, pick 45, who do we have going off the board? So we've had 
after I took Stefan Diggs, we've had a lot of picks in the way. We've had a few quarterbacks go off the board. Guys, if you're drafting on Yahoo, Yahoo do not take quarterbacks this early. Please do yourselves a favor. Uh, Lamar Miller is probably my favorite mid-round running back, but he just got taken. Um, if Royce Freeman falls to me here, I would probably think about it. Josh Gordon is there. I am a little skeptical about Josh Gordon's outlook. Uh, I would at this point, what I would do is like if, if you're thinking about taking Josh Gordon, and I did in the Muck Monday video uh, about Stefan Diggs versus Josh Gordon, who I would take, and I ultimately sided with Diggs. But if I can get Gordon, obviously this is like 20 picks later, I would be probably happy with that. He's returning to the team. Um, it's definitely a risk here, guys, but I think um, it's a risk I'm probably willing to take. And the reason is I would look at the other players on the board, right? So between my pick and the next pick, there's six picks in between. So I'm gonna go Gordon here. There's six, six picks in between, and I'm looking, and I'm like, which? how many running backs are there that I'm okay with? How many wide receivers are there that I'm okay with? And there are two running backs that I really like, and that would be uh, Royce Freeman, and that would be, who's the other one? Um, I just saw another one. Uh, and Jay Ajayi. So I don't love Jay Ajayi, but in the fifth round, I'm okay with him as my RB2. So I am kind of banking on one of those two falling to me. It might be kind of naive, but so far it's working out. And you kind of got to play the board and you got to play who is going to fall to you. Because I don't think if I let Josh Gordon slip there that he falls to me. Um, the other thing I could have done is guaranteed that I take one of those running backs and then grab Chris Hogan, who obviously doesn't have the ceiling of Josh Gordon. But again, guys, I, and I talked about this in my wide receiver rankings video. Fantasy does not always have to be so difficult, man. Chris Hogan is the number one target in this offense. We saw it in the preseason while... Uh, Julian Edelman was on the field. Hogan outsnapped him. He got seven targets with Brady. We see how much this offense wants to pass the ball. They passed the ball 26 times compared to 11 runs. It's going to be a high volume offense with a quarterback who's obviously incredible that throws the ball deep so much. Hogan's going to be not only a red zone target, but a deep target. They're moving him around the formation a lot. He's been running in the slot. He's been running outside as the X. Like He is moving all around, and this is just so, so good for him. So um, Chris Hogan's actually ranked higher than both of these guys for me right now, but I don't want to miss out on the Royce Freeman run right here. Okay, so I I, I did a pretty good job there, and I didn't uh, take my running back early because I would have missed on Josh Gordon, and now I have my selection of Jay Ajayi, Royce Freeman, Deion Lewis, Rex Burkhead. Uh, the Rex Burkhead injury news kind of scares me, although he is back at practice. And I actually have Marshawn Lynch ranked pretty high, but I don't really have faith in this Raiders team to not use Doug Martin, even though they should. So I'm going to go with, where are you, Royce? Royce Freeman as my RB2. So I think we have a pretty strong team so far. I have Diggs and Gordon as my wide receivers, David Johnson, Royce Freeman as my backs, and Gronk as my tight end. We've seen a good amount of tight ends go off the board here. So I would stay away from these mid-round tight ends, man. Oh, God, Jimmy Graham went at 38 overall. That's insane. Um, Greg Olson went 50. I would just, you know, Gronk or whoever of the last, the last of Walker, Kyle Rudolph and Trey Burton, the last of those guys to fall to you is who I would take if I didn't take Gronk. And that's people you could probably wait until like the seventh or eighth round for. So rather than taking Jimmy Graham at 38 or Greg Olson at 50, get another skill player. You can never have too much depth at running back or at wide receiver. Um, so that is my thinking so far. I pretty much have not my starting lineup, but now I'm free to, uh, kind of just draft however many flexes I want. Now, out of, the, out of the squad here, I would love if a Marvin Jones fell to me. Um, I love Chris Hogan. I'm not high on Alshon, man. The injuries kind of scare the poop out of me. Karrion Johnson is a guy that I would really like to get here uh, because here's the thing. I love Karrion Johnson. I love his talent, but there's a good chance that you're going to have to wait on him to overtake that you know starting feature role, and I don't know if we're going to see him in week three already by the time we watch this yeah we will he will have played last night so we'll have a, a better picture of where carry on johnson kind of sits in the pecking order but he's been splitting snaps in this team although he's looked good amir abdullah got the start last time um the, the snaps have been pretty evenly split between carry on uh theo riddick and abdullah what i will say is legarrett blunt got no run with the first team last time which might tell you that carry on has completely surpassed him uh which is a good thing because in order for him to take over the feature role of course he has to outrun Garrett Blunt, and he has to show that he is good enough in the passing game um, to take work from Theo Riddick, which is going to be the tougher of the two to do. What they might have been doing with Amir Abdullah is just showcasing his, uh, show, just showcasing him because he is low in the pecking order, and they might be looking to trade him because there's been a lot of trade rumors about Amir Abdullah this offseason, and I'm sure there's a team looking for like a scat back or, I mean, listen, at, at at this point, he is still a very good athlete. He was an awesome athlete coming out of college, but they just didn't utilize him the right way. If they utilize him 
uh, in the same way that some teams use like a pass catching back, like a, I mean, Kamara, actually Kamara didn't really get that much work in the running game last year. So if a team utilized him like a, like a Kamara and gave him 80 targets, I'm sure he would do really good things with it. So maybe they're showcasing him to see what he's still got. And then hopefully getting trade offers from other teams. Uh, so there goes carry on off the board. Oh, Chris Hogan is still on the board. Let's go fall to me. Do me a solid here, Chris. Do me a solid. I would love Chris Hogan in my flex behind Diggs, Gordon, Hogan. That'd be a pretty, uh, pretty monster lineup. Who do we see go off the board? Yeah, so Trey Burton just went 61st. So I might consider, and Kyle Ru oh no, Kyle Rudolph didn't go, but Evan Ingram did. Jameson Crowder. Someone just picked Crowder over Chris Hogan. That blows my mind. So a couple of guys that I'm still looking at here too are Chris Hogan. Uh, I love what I've seen out of Sanders in terms of him working in the slot. He's had like 50% of Case Keenum's targets so far this preseason. Marquise Goodwin, you got to love as the wide receiver one there. And Nelson Aguilar I like too because I really think Alshon Jeffrey, if he's not on the pup, he's going to start off slow. But obviously I'm going to go with Hogan. Hogan's like my 40th ranked overall player. So to get him at pick 70 is mwah. It's like it's, it, it's just go, it's gorgeous. The process is gorgeous. Um, and now I would probably this is probably where I'd be targeting a tight end. Let me see who's left. So like I said, yeah, Kyle Rudolph, Delaney Walker, Trey Burton already went. So if I don't get if I don't get one of those top two tight ends in round seven in my next pick, then you are going to be not that I hate the the tight ends ranked after them. Like I think Njoku is playing as a full-time starter and he should be good, but um, I'm not sold on him breaking out. I mean, George Kittle, of course, has a lot of breakout potential, but he's dealing with that shoulder injury. Uh, and then Jack Doyle, man. For people that were worried about Eric Ebron, do not be worried about Eric Ebron. Uh, I'm going to pull up a tweet. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it, but hopefully I liked it and then I can pull it up for my likes. But um, Jack Doyle has been running like exclusively with the ones. Ebron's been barely playing with the starting team. Uh, so far this preseason, which I love because I've been on the, the Doyle train and I think he's a much better tight end than Ebron. I think people are just like, I don't know. People are irrationally high on Ebron for no reason. Come on, bro. Forget who tweeted. Maybe it was Graham Barfield. Let me see. Um, okay. So we had running back. Ooh, someone just took Ronald Jones. Come on, bro. Drew Brees went off the board. Sammy Watkins, Crowell. Eh, I'm staying away from that Jets backfield. Probably all together. Because, I mean, we've seen Blau Powell be featured. I don't know. People are getting high on Blau Powell. And they're like, oh, well, you've seen they want to run with him in the ones in the preseason. But, like, Crowell and Elijah McGuire both haven't been playing. That's a horrible argument. Um, so, I mean, if you've been watching my videos, you know how high I'm at Delaney Walker. So, I'm okay with that. Oh, my God. This is the second time I've done that. I'm so used to not taking Gronkowski that I think about taking my tight end there. But this is for you guys that, um, for y'all that don't go with the tight end early, I'd be looking at him. Uh, I'm going to go with Marquise Goodwin here. I don't have a lot of shares of Marquise Goodwin, and I think he's clearly emerging as a wide receiver one there in San Francisco. It would be between Goodwin, Emmanuel Sanders, even Cooper Cup. Um, and I like some of these running backs too. I don't own any shares of Tevin Coleman, and I feel like I should. I don't know why, because... I think Coleman is a guy that's like the perfect running back if you go zero RB. Because one, he's finishing inside the top 20 running backs uh, each of the last two seasons with Freeman there, right? So if you're going zero running back, the the theory behind it is the fact that you're, you're, the production from the wide receiver, because you go zero running back, so you're going wide receivers or tight ends very early. So those guys are obviously your elite players. So they're going to put up so much production that your running backs don't necessarily need to produce. But the fact that you can get Tevin Coleman, 78th pick overall, 7th, 8th round, um, and he's someone who's finished as the top 20 running back in each of the past two seasons. So he gives you standalone value in round 7. Obviously, if anything happens with Freeman, Coleman becomes an easy RB1 play. He becomes the featured workhorse there in this Atlanta offense, right? And, um, and he's like the perfect target if you end up going with wide receivers and tight ends uh, early in your drafts because he's getting volume week to week basis. And I'm not really as concerned with Freeman's durability as a lot of people are. I know the concussions are something scary because if he does get a, he's someone who runs really hard and he loves to hit defenders, which is not good considering, you know, he uses his head a lot to do that. 
Uh, so a, a running back that, you know, rather than evades tackles, like oh, Sean McCoy is probably a lot less risk for head injuries than Freeman is. And if Freeman suffers another concussion, then, uh, then it's going to be bad news for him and good news for obviously Tevin Coleman owners. So that's why I think Coleman is probably like the premier zero RB um, candidate this year. And I just, I don't own enough of Coleman and I think I should diversify. And that's another point, guys. If you're in multiple leagues, uh, I, I'm probably doing like six redraft leagues this year. I, uh, the guys that I don't like, I won't fade in all of my leagues. I like to diversify it because there's always going to be things that I'm wrong about. And there are going to be a lot of things that y'all are wrong about. I know you guys think you're perfect. And anytime you disagree with my takes, you think your take is perfect. And there's a lot of times that y'all will be right and I'll be wrong. So to counter that, if I fade Derrick Henry in five of my redraft leagues and I have one more draft, I'll probably try to take Derrick Henry because the thing is like, you got to outweigh the risks and the rewards. Say I fade Derrick Henry in all of my leagues and he goes off to be a top five running back, I'm screwed. But, you know, if I fade myself and I pick him in one of my leagues, then uh, then I'm set up at least in that league. And hopefully the other players I pick in other leagues are pretty good. Um, but the thing behind it is, like, unless you're completely sold on fading someone, like, I won't take Pierre Garçon in any of my leagues. I just think he has no upside. Like, I hate Pierre Garçon, right? And I usually don't hate players. I hate their ADPs, but I just hate Pierre Garçon. We'll put it that way. He will be someone I don't own in any of my leagues. So unless you are positively sure you want to fade a player, I would try to diversify the guys you draft. I do that a lot in best ball. If you look at my best ball teams, uh, they're, they're, I mean, there are obviously guys I own higher percentages of than other guys, but I try to take like a, as well of a rounded team as I can for all of my drafts. And I try not to specifically completely fade certain players, you know? So I try to diversify it. So that's a tip, I guess, if you're in multiple drafts, if you're obviously in like one or two drafts, then you kind of got to stick to your guns and hope that you are correct in assuming those things. But, you know, that's that. Um, so, yeah, I f sorry I went off on a tight end pitch before. I totally forgot I grabbed Gronk. So this, that's what happens, like, when I did the mock draft with uh, father-son fantasy football and I took Gronk in, like, the second round. I ended up taking Delaney Walker after because I, anytime I take tight end early, I totally forgot I do it because it's so not part of my strategy. But I actually really like how my team is turning out right now. Um, four really solid wide receivers and Diggs, Gordon, Hogan, Goodwin, a mix of upside and floor, uh, running backs. I'm going to have to start getting some depth here. Let me see who's on the board here. And some of these picks are getting auto drafted. You'll see that. But again, in, in fa family and friend leagues, there will be people who take Jacksonville in like the ninth round, 10th round. And I absolutely would advise you not doing that. Okay. So Peyton Barber might be like the steal of the draft right now, guys. And I don't really want to talk about him too much because I feel like I, I've kind of drilled in on him on so many of my videos as of recently. Um, and these later round picks, like ninth round, or when I'm trying to stack up running backs, this is probably when, if I got these four wide receivers, right, Gordon Diggs, um, Chris Hogan, and Goodwin, and I feel really confident about those guys, I would start stacking up uh, late round running backs that have a ton of upside. And that would be guys like Chris Carson, Peyton Barber, um, even though Jordan Wilkins kind of looked like shit, I like that it's in a muddy backfield. And a lot of the guys back there are hurt. Naeem Hines looked terrible. Um, so I'm going to go with Barber here because he's the clear-cut feature back. The fact that Dirk Cutter came out and was like, uh, he was like, yeah, if we give him 20 touches a game, we'd be confident with that. That like tells you that they really want to use this dude, man. Um, so Peyton Barber, the fact that he's going in like the 8th, ninth round is craziness because he's getting all of the starter snaps there in Tampa Bay. And uh, yeah, he's, he's someone that I love getting late. So... Um, I think he has like a 50, at, he, at least in the beginning of the year, he's got like a 15 touch workload floor. Um, and that is something that very much intrigues me. I would also probably try getting a piece of this Green Bay backfield. Um, I wonder how early Jamal Williams went. Let me see. Uh, Jamal Williams went like three or four picks before me. I like Jamal Williams. He's someone that I want to have on a few of my teams as well. Um, the ankle injury was super minor. He's already back at practice. And I think he's going to be a starter there. And I think unless he loses the job, which I don't know if, I don't think he really is going to do it. He's going to get a huge workload. So I might take, as much as I like Aaron Jones as the talent, I think he's more talented than Williams is. There's just a lot working against him. He like missed all of training camp with injuries, a hamstring concussion. And now he's got the two game suspension. He's just very, 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 very much falling behind in the depth chart. Um, so he kind of scares me. So unless he falls to me, I'm probably not touching him. I would love Chris Carson here if he falls to me. And this is the reason I don't, you guys shouldn't take quarterbacks early, guys. Be, for the fact that all of these guys are still on the board. Like, you can get Ben Roethlisberger. You can get, even if you wanted to wait and get Mar Marcus Mariota, um, I would be fine with them as my QB1. And you could probably wait another, like, four rounds. 
So I'm going to grab Chris Carson because as of right now, he is the starter in Seattle. I don't necessarily think his ceiling is as high as people think because I think like best case scenario is that Carson absolutely dominates touches over the first few weeks. Looks good doing it. And then once Rashad Penny's back, and I'm pretty sure they've already had reports that Rashad Penny will be ready for week one. Let me, uh, let me double check that. Will be ready for week one. Carroll definitively stated that Doug Baldwin, knee, and Penny would be ready for the Seahawks season opener in Denver. Carroll continued that Penny would have a chance to play in Seattle's preseason finale next Thursday. Despite being limited, it's a terrific sign. The first rounder returned to practice in pads Tuesday. So he returned to practice in pads on Tuesday. Um, so he'll be good to go. Uh, I do still think this will be a complete running back by committee. And um, I, I think as of right now, Carson is the starter there. And uh, maybe over the first month of the season, Carson does work and then eventually turns into an RB, RBBC running back by committee. But maybe Carson is a sell high guy to people that people that uh, probably didn't follow football this early into the season. Like people that really didn't start preparing for their fantasy football drafts until now. There's a good chance they don't know much about Rashad Penny. Right. Because if you're not watching like the NFL draft, and you're not really into it and, and analyzing rookies like I've been over the last few months, um, then you know, and you just started looking now, you're going to be like, okay, Rashad Penny's like been injured, broke his finger, he's behind Chris Carson. And you might be able to sell Chris Carson if he has a few good games over the first month of the season, because Penny will, right? The argument is that he was the first round capital, which is obviously um, that says a lot. And that says that they want to use him. And in the preseason games before he got hurt, they were splitting the work. Like it was pretty much split down the middle. And I expect that to be the case when the games actually pick up and we're in the regular season, um, at least once we get into like the second month or so. So for Carson, I think he could start off really fast and he, he might be someone you could sell to an owner who doesn't know much about the rookies or doesn't know much about, um, or, or, you know, didn't start looking at their teams and didn't start preparing for the drafts until later because they wouldn't really know much about Penny. And they're just assuming that Chris Carson's going to be the guy. So Chris Carson starts out strong. He's definitely a sell high candidate in my opinion, as much, you know, I always fuck around and as much as I love Chris Carson, um, even if he does take over like the starting role and he gets 60% of touches, the pennies 40, like it's still a really bad offensive line. I'm sure they're still going to finagle some, someone into the pass catching role. It's just like, I don't know. It's a, it's a messy situation on a team that I think is going to disappoint a lot this year. So, um, so what do we have? We have two running backs. We have Goodwin on the bench. And we've seen a lot of guys go off the board. So we're seeing a bit of a quarterback run right now. And uh, I, I've, I've been getting this question a lot. Like, if you want to take Winston, I really like Winston. Even coming back from the suspension this year, people are getting lower and lower and lower on him. Right now, he's, what is that, like quarterback 25? Uh, so with, with Winston, actually, let me, I'll get back into that after this pick goes. So Nelson Aguilar is dealing with a lower body injury, apparently. But I think he's like a ridiculous value. So I'm going to grab Aguilar here. Assuming there's no one else I like on the board much. Let me see what running backs are there right quick. Mm, I do like Jordan Wilkins, but Aguilar is a much better pick here. Uh, I think Aguilar, Aguilar could possibly fight to be the wide receiver one there in fantasy in Philly. I mean, if, if Jeffrey goes on the pup, then obviously. But Aguilar had an interesting career, right? His first two years, he was really bad. After being a first-round pick, I really liked him coming out of college. After being a first-round pick, they didn't utilize him right in Philadelphia. They were running him on the outside on like 80% of his snaps and 80% of his routes. Last year, they moved him into the slot where he played most of his um, most of his routes. He had most of his action in the slot, like 80%. And there you saw the production come with it. So if they keep him there and if Alshon Jeffrey is hurt, and, and both of those things I expect to happen, he, like I said before, if Alshon Jeffrey is not out on the pup, I think he might miss the first game, maybe two games, or start off slow, either one. So... I am uh, super high on Alshon Jeffrey. I mean, uh, uh, Nelson Aguilar. I think he might end up leading this team in fantasy points. But as I was saying for quarterbacks, if you want to grab a Jameis Winston, he is a really good person to pair with Big Ben and Matthew Stafford who are off the board or Alex Smith because Alex Smith has a really easy schedule to start off with. Um, but I am going to go with Marcus Mariota here because he is my highest ranked guy of the guys still left on the board. And I would be okay with him as my quarterback one. I think the offense that they've instilled in Tennessee, you could see what it's already doing for statistics. Like in the preseason game, they're moving quickly and uh, the dump offs to Deion Lewis and just like you're seeing like Taewon Taylor took one to the house. I think Mariota is going to benefit from having um, 
an offense like uh, Lafleur had in St. Louis or Los Angeles last year with the Rams. Like Jared Goff had the single most touchdowns thrown behind the line of scrimmage, right? So it was a lot of after the catch work, and I think that's what we're going to see with Mariota. So even if he's not a great passer, I think he's going to really, really, really produce based on the offense and setting up these other playmakers in really good spots where like a Taewon Taylor can take a screen to the house, which we saw uh, plenty of last year, right? Like Deion Lewis is going to be the pass catching role that Todd Gurley had last year, and he's going to get a ton of screens and dump offs and and really help Mariota in the production category. So I, I'm not really sold on Mariota being an elite passer, like a thrower by any means, but I think his, his running floor as well as the offense he's in uh, means really good things for him this year. So like Mariota there, and again, what I was saying with like Jameis Winston suspended for the first three games, but like Alex Smith gets, um, who does Smith get the first three games? I think it's like Arizona, Indy, Green Bay or something. Um, even Tyrod Taylor has a great start, I think, to the season. So he gets, yeah, it was Arizona, Indy, Green Bay. No no passing defenses that you're actually really scared of. Uh, then he plays the Saints, but Jameis Winston will be back from his suspension at that point. And um, let me see, where was the Browns? Were the Browns on this? No. I think I found that Tyrod was also a really good pair with Jameis Winston, ironically. So they start off with the Steelers at home. Um, and, you know, Steelers were a good defense, but again, they lose Ryan Shazier and he was like the heart and soul of that D and they have not looked very good this preseason. Um, so, I mean, it doesn't mean they're going to be a bad defense, but that's not a defense you have to stay away from. And plus they're at home. Then they travel on the road at, at New Orleans, which is kind of tough. But then Alex Smith is playing, I think, was it Indy or it was either Indy or Green Bay. So you could play him. Then they go at the Jets, uh, at home against the Jets. Then he's got the Raiders who are an awful pass defense. Um, so, you know, those in, in terms of the first few games, you can mix and match a bunch of the quarterbacks there. Randall Cobb fell to 135. So I've been high on Randall Cobb, and I actually want to put this piece in because I was listening to the Fantasy Pros podcast yesterday, and uh, Mike Taglieri is one of the guys that like hosts that podcast, and he is super nervous about Randall Cobb because he went back and looked at everyone who's had the same injury as Cobb in terms of that foot injury, and he said that if the foot injury happens in the season prior – and you have the surgery that let the season prior to the season coming up, then you're good to go. But any of the people that have had the foot surgery that Randall Cobb has had during the off season leading up to the season, uh, he said not a single wide receiver or a single skill player has had a successful season following that. So he's like, if you have the correct recovery time for it, then you, uh, you know, you could be, you could have a good year, but he basically, he basically went back and just looked and said that the Cobb injury is a lot more serious than we think it is. And, uh, that kind of scares me away from Cobb a little bit, but I mean, in the, in the 12th round, obviously that's monster upside considering what the wide receiver two in the green Bay offense does for us. But that also means that a guy like Geronimo Allison would get even more value. And there are like four guys, actually there's like six late round wide receivers that I really like, uh, on this list here. There's also Jordan Wilkins. I kind of like the kind of like stacking up running backs down here, um, but I think there's too much upside in it on these wide receivers. So Anthony Miller, you guys know I love. Uh, Kenny Galladay was one that just went off the board. Chris Godwin has monster upside, and uh, Keelan Cole, I love that he's running with the ones, and that's the reports. Did Geronimo Allison already get picked? Oh, he's all the way down there. Cool. I could probably get him late, late in my draft. So I'm gonna go with Anthony Miller. Y'all know I gotta stay true to the brand. <laughs> What? Oh, they just took a defense for me. They took Baltimore. I guess I timed out. Not mad about that because Baltimore is probably my favorite defense to take this year. Actually, damn, they're out. With, they're without Jimmy Smith, which sucks. Um, but I, I'm someone who streams week to week, so all I'm looking at is that week one game, and I'll probably drop them and try to pick up someone else. The Ravens play the Bills at home in week one. Three things I look for in a fantasy defense when streaming. Playing at home, check. Over-under is small, 40 and a half, check. Look at all the other ones. This might be the lowest over-under of the week, check. Uh, and being heavy favorites. They are a touchdown favorite, check. So Baltimore is probably my favorite um, defense for week one. I also like the Saints because they play Tampa Bay at home without Jameis Winston. So I'll go Anthony Miller here if they let me. And y'all know I love Anthony Miller because Trubisky loves throwing over the middle of the field. Anthony Miller's a stud and they're in this new offense. Um, so actually, oh, there's only 15 rounds in this one. So I got two more picks left and there's a lot of wide receivers I like, but I guess I'll have to go with a 
Hopefully Jordan Wilkins falls to me. He's not going to, I guess, because he's the next ranked running back and people are auto-drafting at this point. few guys I like. I guess I would look at my team and I would say, should I handcuff anyone? Should I grab the backups? So David Johnson, uh, I'm probably not handcuffing anyone. Uh, I just think there's no value in taking his handcuff right now. Maybe something I, I would say maybe handcuff-wise once you're later into the season, maybe six weeks, eight weeks into the season, and you pretty much know your starting lineup, um, I think at that point, if you own a guy like David Johnson, maybe you want to handcuff because you, you'll know by that point who probably is the clear backup, and you'll be you know preparing yourself for the playoffs if, if you're in that position. But I think drafting the handcuff like this early is kind of um, kind of counterintuitive. You're just wasting a bench spot, and so much so much changes in the early weeks of the NFL season. Um, like running back by committees kind of play themselves out within the first four to six weeks. So there's a, <coughs> there's a lot of movement going on. Um, and, and you want to have those slots open. You don't want to have them holding there because those backups don't, don't hold any value to you right now, but it, it kind of helps you later in the year, you know, cause if something were to happen to David Johnson, like three weeks before the playoffs, then you have the guy behind him, but you don't have, you don't have to hold him for the first like six weeks because he's not going to be kind of useful at all. If that makes sense. Um, so Jordan Wilkins still on the board. So I would be looking at Wilkins, Ty Montgomery. Devontae Booker is a guy I might take because I have Royce Freeman. I think Devontae Booker has standalone value. Not a lot, but he does. Uh, Corey Clement's a guy I'm definitely looking at, although he's been dealing with a lower leg injury, which is kind of weird because they haven't really said much about it. I think he is going to be heavily involved in this offense. I think he's going to be uh, not a time, not a necessarily a huge time split, but I think he's going to take work away from Ajayi. I think he's going to play the third down role. Uh, Jai is not as good of a pass blocker as Clement is, which will get him on the field. Um, I also should probably take a backup to Gronk. So I have a lot of plans right now that I'm not sure I could really live out. Ricky Seals-Jones would have been the backup I would have taken there, but he just got taken. Um, Austin Hooper, I know he had that big game last week, but I don't think his role changes whatsoever in this Atlanta offense, and it was almost nothing last year. So uh, I, I'm good. I, apart from like the first week, of week one of last year for the Falcons, like he almost did nothing. Um, and that was like a big broken coverage play, which gave him like 125 receiving yards that first game and people got hyped. And then he literally did almost nothing. All right. So time out went off the board. Uh, time out was someone I'd be looking at because like I said, I want running backs with upside. And if someone gets hurt in that backfield, which we've seen a lot of injuries to that backfield, time out becomes not only like a guy who can get five to eight rushes, but he's going to be used heavily in the passing game, I think as well. Um, Corey Clement. Let's see if we got any other values. Ah, dude, I can't pass off Chris Godwin here. I think there's just too much upside with him. So I will grab Godwin and then maybe look for a running back later. And guys, uh, I haven't taken a kicker yet. So here's, well, actually almost all of my leagues have finally gotten rid of kickers. Thank God we just did it in the E-Town get down. And if you're watching this, the E-Town get down league meeting and league punishment video is coming out later today. I think at like noon it schedules to release. So enjoy that one. I think you guys will like it. Um, but in terms of a kicker, guys, if you're drafting this early, if you're drafting before the season starts, I would absolutely leave the kicker and even defensive spots open and draft guys like Corey Clement and draft a guy like Spencer Ware or James Conner or something like that. Because in the, in the next few weeks, there still are going to be injuries that happen at practice or in the week three preseason game or maybe even the week four preseason game, even though starters don't necessarily play that much. But if, like, Le'Veon Bell, God forbid, went down with, like, an ACL tear next week and you have James Conner instead of a kicker, you just got yourself an RB1 instead of who cares about a kicker. You know what I mean? So if you're drafting this late in this – or this early, right before week four preseason games are done, I would do that. And then right before the games kick off, just drop those guys that, that don't have any more value and then pick up your kicker. But definitely wait on kicker. Uh, I would also wait on defense because, guys, last year I know you want to say Jacksonville, but – um, also in the fantasy pros podcast that I listen to, um, up right now, huh? I also wouldn't take a backup quarterback in one team leagues, unless you are doing like the Jameis Winston thing. I'm not going to take a backup to Gronk right now. Cause any of these guys that I want to take, they'd be on the wire anyways, if I need to take them, um, running backs. Yeah. I'll take Corey Clement here. So I, I it's a very high upside bench. I'm, I'm a big fan of this bench right here. Uh, but what I was saying about defenses, guys, they uh, they do like a stat of the day or a stat of the episode every time. And basically over the last five years of the defenses that have been picked in the top five, so according to the ADP of the defenses over the last five years, the top five guys, 
None of them, none of the 25 teams have finished as a top five defense. It's basically telling you, us as fantasy players, what we predict to be good defenses almost never pan out. And they've actually said of the teams picked in the top five, more of them have finished as literally the last place defense in fantasy than the number one defense. And considering none of them finished top five, that obviously makes sense. But the fact that one of them finished as dead last is, is kind of crazy. So that's the reason. And Jacksonville was an outlier of a defense last year. Um, they're like the best fantasy defense over the last bunch of years. Uh, so I'm not going high on them. And just the fact that we are horrible as fantasy owners at predicting defensive success. So this is my team. Mariota, Diggs, Gordon, David Johnson, Freeman, Gronk, Hogan. Big fan of this team. Big, 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 big. That's a big bite for a 12-team league to have uh, Goodwin, Barber, Carson, Aguilar, Miller, Godwin, Clement on the bench. Uh, I think I did pretty well here. So if you agree, actually, if you disagree too, please just drop a thumbs up because obviously I put a lot of work into these videos and I would very much appreciate it. But this will wrap it up for this video. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll have videos coming out all next week as well as into the season. I'm trying to figure out how I want my content schedule to work out within the season. I think... Tuesdays might be a recap of the previous week. Uh, Thursday might be my wide receiver cornerback matchup video. And maybe Saturday will just be Q&As, like um, picking out some of the questions I get on social media and answering them on a video. So maybe that'll go Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and then Sunday I always live stream for like the two hours leading up to kickoff where I'll answer as many questions as I possibly can. But uh, that's going to be it for now. So I hope you all enjoyed. And, uh, and that's it. So drop that thumbs up if you did and subscribe to the channel if you're new.